Welcome to our first um, Young CIOP educational webinar. I'm Teresa de Rojas, I'm a pediatric oncologist and I work as scientific coordinator of Accelerate. I'm also a member of the Young CIOP steering committee and it's, it's really a pleasure to be able to moderate um, this first session that will be about liquid biopsy in pediatric solid tumors. Next slide, please. So on this first session, um, the program will be divided into two parts. The first part will be the, the lecture about liquid biopsy presented by Dr. Elisa Izquierdo from Children's Hospital Niño Jesus in Madrid. And then on the second part of the webinar, uh, we will have an activity update about uh, Young CIOP presented by Dr. Maria Ott uh, from the University of Bern in Switzerland. And we will have the opportunity to have a round table uh, with the whole uh, Young CIOP steering committee and um, let, your, let you ask questions and give us suggestions on how to move next. So a few uh, rules so that the meeting can run smoothly. Um, of course, this is a, a virtual meeting. So uh, we will try to be as interactive and close to you as possible. And to do that, uh, if you can mute yourself if you're not speaking, uh, can you press the next? Uh, thank you. Um, if you have um, a question, we will have opportunity to ask questions after each part um, of, the, of, of the webinar. Just write so in the chat. You can just write, I have a question. And then uh, when I give you the floor, you just activate your uh, microphone and your cam and you can ask your question um, right away. And that's basically um, all. So you do not need to write the question in the chat, but uh, really just, I have a question and, and then you can ask uh, through the microphone. Next slide. So, and then I would like to do a very brief introduction uh, on the main presenter, uh, Dr. Elisa Izquierdo. She's a molecular biologist specialized in pediatric oncology. She developed her research career mainly at the Institute of Cancer Research in London, UK. And she has vast experience with uh, next generation sequencing and also um, with liquid biopsy, which is why we asked her to, to do this presentation today. Um, she has been mainly active in the field of neuroblastoma and high-grade gliomas uh, regarding liquid biopsy. And in this context, she used plasma and CSF uh, from patients from the Herbie clinical trial and from other studies to identify molecular alterations in ctDNA. She also worked in the Biomed trial um, and she established patient-derived in vitro models identifying biomarkers of response um, to compounds. She also worked on resistance models to further inform novel treatment um, at tumor relapse especially. Um, Dr. Izquierdo recently joined Hospital Niño Jesús in Madrid to set up the Oncogenomics Unit um, and with the aim of establishing a molecular profiling program for children with cancer. I had the privilege to work with her, so I had the opportunity to see her brilliance in close distance and therefore I am sure that her lecture on this really hot topic will be brilliant as well. And now to Elisa. Thank you very much, Teresa, for the kind introduction and the invitation uh, to be here. So hello, everyone. It's a real pleasure uh, to tell you today about liquid biopsy. So I have been asked to give an overview about liquid biopsy in pediatric oncology. Uh, and I will also share with you some of the work that I've done regarding liquid biopsy during my PhD at the Institute of Cancer Research in London in the glioma team under Christian supervision. So in the last decade, a huge effort has been made to elucidate the genomic landscape of pediatric solid tumors, leading to the conclusion that these patients have a lower tumor burden compared to adult cancer, and that childhood cancers have a higher mutation ratio in epigenetic regulators. And the work that we and others have carried out to characterize pediatric high-grade gliomas and the APG 
have demonstrated the importance of genomic profiling as these tumors are defined by different molecular entities having distinct clinical features. Similarly, fantastic work has been made in the medulloblastoma field, highlighting the importance of methylation to correctly diagnose and stratify medulloblastoma patients. So with the technology ready to characterize the biology of these tumors, numerous strategies and platforms are taking place in the world. And here you just see a summary of the different strategies across the countries. Uh, each of them have different levels of genomic analysis. So for instance, in the States, the pediatric match trial is based on panel sequencing, uh, while INFORM in Germany have a more comprehensive approach where they are doing whole exome sequencing RNA sequencing, methylation, and gene expression array. So the ultimate goal of these strategies is to enable comprehensive reporting of diagnostic, prognostic, and predictive biomarkers. So many of these strategies are linked to basket trials, uh, but also to disease-specific umbrella trials and molecular aberration-driven strategies, as well as FDA-approved drugs. So in order to perform molecular analysis, we need to obtain tumor material to extract RNA, DNA and RNA. And although obtaining tumor tissue at diagnosis is a routine practice for most pediatric uh, solid tumors, this is not always the case. For instance, tumors uh, with arising within the brainstem are challenging to biopsy or renal tumors that are not biopsy due to risk of tumor rupture. So they sometimes are very invasive methods that are associated with risks to the patients. The material might not be sufficient to perform pathology and molecular analysis. And as we know that tumors are highly heterogeneous, the molecular information is limited to the area that we are biopsying. Um, doing, uh, using biopsy to perform tumor monitoring during treatment is challenging and is not uh, feasible. So therefore, um, liquid biopsy is a powerful tool as a source of tumor material. Liquid biopsies refer to biological fluids uh, from cancer tissue, which represents a source of tumor biomarkers, such as secreting tumor cells, ctRNA, ctDNA, exosomes, microRNAs, proteins, etc. Um, the, the use of these biomarkers, although the blood is the most typical source, nearly all biofluids uh, in the body uh, can be used as liquid biopsy, and this will depend on the anatomical location of the primary and the metastatic tumor. So for example, in central nervous system tumors, CSF is a powerful source for these biomarkers. So we just mentioned the limitation of tissue biopsy and how liquid biopsy represents an exciting approach to overcome some of the limitations of tissue biopsy, such as sample accessibility for longitudinal studies, is a less invasive method to obtain tumor material, sometimes can better represent the molecular alterations um, and has a lower cost for sample collection. And um, it is compatible with longitudinal studies for monitoring treatment response and evaluating clonal evolution to detect resistance alterations and also predictive biomarkers at relapse. So in this talk, I will focus on circulating DNA so circulating free DNA is thought to be released from cells, mostly undergoing uh, cell death through apoptosis, necrosis, and possibly active secretion. Cell-free DNA can arise from, from um, uh, cancer cells, but also from normal cells. So when we are studying circulating free DNA, we have a pool of normal CFDNA and tumor CFDNA. Therefore, we need highly sensitive methods to detect um, CTDNA. Uh, which sometimes can be can represent as low as 0.01% of the total of CFDNA. Um, numerous studies have shown that uh, the fragments of uh, CTDNA are shorter to the fragments of CFDNA derived from non-tumor molecules in plasma. So it is, it is always also known that the concentration of CTDNA in plasma has been shown to correlate with tumor size and stage. So patients with high tumor burden have higher levels of CTDNA, and that the different tumor types have different levels of CTDNA. So for instance, colorectal and ovarian cancer patients have high levels of CTDNA in plasma, whereas gliomas have very low levels. And I will come back to that later on my talk. So one of the benefits of liquid biopsy is it's used to correlate the presence of driver mutations 
uh, with tumor burden and therapy response at multiple time points, preventing the risks, costs, and skill expertise of surgical intervention. In this context, many pediatric solid tumors uh, are characterized by uh, hotspot mutations and fusion genes. So for example, um, a summary of the other hybrid gliomas and the APG here show the presence of hotspot mutations in the histone genes that can be used to characterize and diagnose these patients, but also mutations in IDH1 or BRAF, such as PC100E or tandem duplication, sorry, uh, duplications in BRAF. Um, and the recent work that we and others have performed in infant gliomas have characterized uh, fusions in NTRAC uh, ALK, ROS1, and MET uh, genes. Similarly, many sarcomas are driven by single fusion genes, as you can see here in this table. All this makes childhood cancers perfect candidates for the use of cTDNA to monitor treatment response, enabling early detection of tumor progression over the course of the patient disease. So liquid biopsy in pediatric oncology is behind their adult counterpart, and most of the study performed up to date are retrospective, proof of concept study in small cohorts. Nevertheless, uh, they illustrate the exciting opportunity to incorporate uh, liquid biopsy in clinical practice. And here you have a table with some of the studies published in neuroblastoma, even sarcoma, uh, diffuse midline gliomas, et cetera, where they've applied different methodology, such as droplet digital PCR, qPCR, or NGS to detect uh, copy number alterations as well as hotspot mutation. So I will now discuss in detail some of this study just to give you a glimpse of the field. So while field studies have compared the levels of plasma ctDNA amongst pediatric tumors, in this study, uh, ultra low for genome sequencing was conducted on 45 pediatric diagnostic patients uh, pre-treated in plasma samples, and they identified ctDNA in more than half of the samples. Also, it appears that neuroblastoma patients have higher levels of ctDNA compared to osteosarcoma, bratomyelitis sarcoma, Ewins, and Wilms. In this study as well, there were some patients that, had, that were collected at multiple time points, and um, plasma showed that changes in the ctDNA levels corresponded to treatment response. Uh, in this, um, in this um, paper that we published uh, regarding the clinical implementation of uh, initiation sequencing in the UK um, from tissue, just as a feasibility study, we included 12 patients where we had uh, plasma for, this, um, for these patients with alterations uh, in, the, in the shown um, here in the tumor. And this is the, you can see here in the table the diagnosis of these patients and NGS uh, CTDNA was conducted in ctDNA. And as you can see here, the tumor types are diverse and the alterations were detected in the tumor and the plasma for many of them, especially for the samples that were taken at the same time point. However, we observed some discrepancies from um, samples that uh, we had plasma that was collected after at least one relapse and variants were detected in the plasma that were not detected in the FFP sample. So for example, there was one neuroblastoma patient where we had a mutation in FFP sample that was found in the plasma, but a, a secondary mutation in ALK, a hotspot mutation was found only in the ctDNA sample. So this, uh, this is just an example of the potential of using liquid biopsy to detect genetic alterations and the importance of studying uh, clonal evolution. So numerous studies have been done in neuroblastoma and they've shown the potential of liquid biopsy applied to this disease. In particular, shallow whole genome sequencing of CFDNA has been evaluated as a relatively cheap way to assess copy number variations. So here we have uh, a copy number profile on the, the tumor, the ctDNA on the top and the tumor on the bottom, and there the profile is almost identical. You can see here a chromosome one deletion, Mikan um, amplification in chromosome two, as well as a duplication of chromosome 17. Um, mutations also have been detected in neuroblastoma. In this particular example, is by using holexome sequencing, but also other studies have applied droplet digital PCR to identify mutations in ALK and other genes. Furthermore, in this study, uh, where you can see here a Venn diagram, we can see examples of mutations that were only detected in the sequence in tumor DNA and not detected in the primary tumor biopsy, 
suggesting that liquid biopsy may capture better the tumor heterogeneity and the detection of alterations that are present in metastatic sites. So the application of um, CTDNA has also been studied in even sarcoma. And in this particular um, uh, work, uh, what they did is to evaluate the presence of diffusion by interpreting rpcr in 234 blood samples from 20 even sarcoma patients. And the levels of the fusion uh, was correlated with a uh, tumor volume. As you can see here, there was a high correlation between the levels of the number of copies and the tumor volume that was calculated from MRI and CT imaging. So the majority of the patients in this study showed fast reduction of CFDNA during initial chemotherapy. However, we can see here in this example that when the patient relapsed, relapsed uh, we, we see a high a higher concentration of CTDNA and uh, the fusion, the presence of the fusion. So I will tell you to, today a little bit as well about uh, the use of CTDNA in pediatric patients with brain tumors. And here we have uh, that the brain, blood brain barrier limits the transport of nuclear acids. So we, if you remember the graph in the beginning, the glioma patients were at the bottom of the list in terms of uh, the amount of CTDNA in plasma. There are very few studies published. They are mainly in uh, diffuse midline gliomas and medulloblastoma. And this, uh, this, the, the work that has been published have found higher detection rates in cerebrospinal fluid compared to plasma. So the use, across, the use of plasma across brain tumors remains to be explored. There is a high variation amongst the study with a very little concordance that ranges from 16% of patients having cDNA to 80%. So this can be due to the technical um, and the methods that employ to detect uh, these alterations. And there's a need to develop and implement high sensitivity methods to evaluate the utility of plasma cDNA in brain tumors. So I will show you a couple of papers that have been published. Uh, so in, for instance, this particular work was performed by Laura Scudero and colleagues in Valderon Hospital in Barcelona. They, they, they sequence uh, tissue, cerebrospinal fluid, and plasma from 13 medulloblastoma patients, and CSF was taken prior surgery. They showed that uh, CTDNA was more abundant in CSF compared to plasma. So 77, around 77% of the patients had alterations uh, in the CSF. However, only one where they detected uh, alterations in the plasma. Very exciting, they use this work uh, to they use uh, CSF cDNA to classify these tumors to the correct subtype and risk uh, subgroups, providing crucial information about uh, prognostic of these patients. So the work that they did, uh, they demonstrated that genomic alterations identified in CSF cDNA can recapitulate those present in the tumor, and hence the analysis of CSF cDNA constitutes a less invasive alternative to analyze the genomic alterations of medulloblastoma. So I'm going to show you as well the results of a, a study that we performed that has been just recently accepted, or yesterday we heard. Uh, so in this study, we, uh, we had samples, liquid biopsy from multiple sources of um, plasma, serum, CSF, and cystic fluid from 32 pediatric hygrogliomas and the APE patients with non molecular alterations uh, for instance, some patients had H3F3A mutations, um, in BRAF, it's 100D, uh, SCBR1, IDH1, TP53, uh, PICTCA, and one sample with a MECAN amplification. So the first goal of this study was to uh, develop a detection of um, a method to detect these alterations by a droplet digital PCR. And we validated these assays and uh, ran run this methodology in this set of samples. So here you have the, the volume that we used from plasma serum CSF and cis fluid and the concentration, the CFDNA concentration that we obtained. Um, positive um, droplets, so CTDNA was found by applying this methodology in uh, plasma serum CSF and cystic fluid. Here you can see a summary of the mutations and the sample type that was um, um, these mutations were found. And in concordance with other studies, it was found that cDNA was present at higher percentage and greater baryonal frequency in CFDNA derived from CSF compared to plasma and or serum. 
So we, uh, we detected cdDNA from 70%, so from around 70% of uh, patients from, derived from CSF compared to 26% in plasma and 33% in serum. So this data supports the use of CSF over plasma as a source of tumor DNA from molecular profiling using this methodology. Just uh, another example that also has just been recently accepted is the use of ctDNA in, in diffuse midline glioma as a biomarker of response to treatment. So in this particular uh, study done by Carl Koshman in Michigan, uh, they used droplet digital PCR to detect a uh, histone H3K27 mutation uh, in correlation to response to ONC201. So in, in the left-hand side, you have a patient that was responding to the therapy and um, in orange, you have the alt frequency of the mutation uh, and how in, in time and um, with the treatment, the levels are reducing. And on the right-hand side, you have another patient, similar results, but in this case, uh, the sample, the origin of the sample was cerebrospinal fluid. So there are some challenges uh, that we need to improve. Uh, we need some validation of the analytics and the methodology that is currently employed to allow detection of very low alert frequency to detect these alterations. There is a need to perform uh, these studies in larger amount of patients in the context of clinical trials, and this is currently undergoing. So there are currently a small number of ongoing clinical trials evaluating the use of liquid biopsy. Uh, this particular NGS kits and Michado uh, are two clinical trials open in France and led by Kutrun. They are employing NGS-based methodology to detect genetic alterations in cDNA derived from blood, cerebrospinal fluid, bone marrow, and during in metastatic pediatric tumors. And additionally, there's another study in Australia that uh, similarly they are uh, using this liquid biopsy in high-risk uh, children with cancer. So the ultimate goal will be to implement liquid biopsy in clinical practice to guide treatment. This is going to be crucial for tumors where biopsy is not feasible. It's, I think it's going to be very important to monitor patient therapy over the course of the disease, as we saw some examples already, and to monitor clonal evolution in order to evaluate the emergence of resistance mutations. So I would like to thank some of the people that contributed to the few examples that I show you. Uh, and of course, the Guillaume team and my supervisor, Christian. And I will happily take some questions. Uh, thank you so much for listening and for your attention. Many thanks, Elisa. That, that was uh, excellent. And you really did an, an effort to make it easier for us MDs to understand uh, this subject that can be complicated. I, I think the majority of the audience uh, are indeed uh, uh, pediatric oncologists and MDs. Um, so it, yeah, I, I think it was uh, brilliant. We have some time because you all also adhered um, exquisitely to the time uh, constraints. So uh, please go ahead and ask questions. Just write in the chat um, that you want to have a question to, to, to pose a question and then uh, I will give you the floor. Um, in the meantime, I can already ask myself, you mentioned briefly uh, that uh, there are some important differences to adult, to the adult oncology uh, world. Um, why do you think we are uh, again behind those advances uh, in adult oncology where there are already even commercial kits for uh, liquid biopsy. Yes, thanks, Teresa, for raising uh, the issue. Um, I think it's, just, it's, it's the numbers. There are not enough uh, patients, uh, and there are huge efforts needs to be made in order to have enough numbers across, so across the different institutions. Um, it is true there are FDA approved tests specifically for adult cancers and that's not the case for, for kids. So we are really behind and we need to collaborate and work together in order to, 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 yeah, to establish uh, the liquid biopsy across different institutions and make up the numbers that, uh, that uh, really need to, to, we need to have those numbers to, to have statistics, to, to be able to compare different tumor types and, uh, and evaluate the, the use of liquid biopsy across different tumor types in pediatric uh, tumors. 
that's that's excellent. Many thanks. And I think uh, Anna uh, Valain or Valen uh, wants to uh, raise a question. Can you please activate your your microphone and perhaps your camera if you want? So hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, great. So hi from Latvia. Thanks for the great presentation. I have a practical question. Have you uh, had any uh, use uh, in clinical decision making already with the results of the uh, of finding the CT DNA and somehow deciding in changing therapy already? Is that uh, or is that only on the way now? So thank you for for your question. So um, not myself because our study was retrospectively. Um, but um, within our institution, uh, we have some samples where we didn't have access to tissue, and we send the the CSF uh, to Barcelona, in particular in San Juan de Deu, and um, these patients were diagnosed because the H3K27 mutation was found, so they had a diagnosis based on CSF uh, um, analysis. And, and I think it's critical that we start uh, using this methodology for patients where we cannot, we don't have access, we don't really know very well the diagnosis. And um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's the future. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, welcome. Many thanks. Uh, I think uh, Maria Gilda Costa wants to ask a question. Do you, would you like to activate your microphone? I write my question. Do you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. we can hear you, Maria. Did you control the CSCF cytology in the positive cases in CSCF? Do you understand my question? Yes, yes, I do. So we didn't uh, because this was not the purpose of our study, but I know other people have done. And um, where CSF uh, histology was negative. Some uh, studies were able to find alterations in the same sample uh, using ctDNA in, in CSF. So in the sensitivity of some of these methodologies is so high that uh, that the use is uh, it's, it's 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 great for for um, monitoring and uh, detecting those alterations. I, I think this question is very important. Because if we have a positive cytology, probably we are just um, showing the, uh, the, the DNA of the cells, positive neoplastic cells. Do I understand mm -hmm. my, my point? Okay. Of course, yeah, yes, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we also have a question from uh, Reineke, Reineke Schut. Hi, Teresa, but I also Hi. saw Ruben and he was in one of the slides, so he can go first. Ah, okay, um, apologies. Then uh, uh, Ruben, if you want to activate your microphone and your camera even. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, uh, very nice presentation and also thank you for uh, referring to our review article. Um, we're also trying to do work on CSF uh, in liquid biopsies or in brain tumors, um, but we found that we have the issue that for the CSF collection that there is a very um, um, gap in the literature for how to collect and how to process the CSF. So do you have any comments or suggestions for how to collect uh, CSF? Yes, yeah, so we were basically collecting CSF as we are doing for plasma. Um, so if you can collect the, the sample within, if you can process the sample within two hours, uh, we will be using uh, normal tubes or even EDTA tubes. And if not, uh, just uh, some tubes to, to be able to stabilize uh, the DNA by like extract tubes or Ariosa tubes. Um, and then just a brief centrifugation and um, stick to the supernatant. But also what we saw that uh, in, the, in, the, in the pellet, uh, you can have as well secreting tumor cells. So don't forget that uh, that sample is also useful or can be useful to detect those alterations. Yes, that's the, the thing that we are wondering, like, do we only use a supernatant? Do we use do you complete CSF without any centrifugation step? Because like uh, Maria already mentioned, if there are um, circulating tumor cells over there, then it's actually beneficial to include these. So, yes, uh, but, uh, but if you have any normal cells, 
you will be yeah. you will have contamination of your results and your pool of it will be lower so you will be detecting you know you will have high you will need higher detection rate in order to so my, my advice will be to study both separately and I know that some people that for example Mara Vinci in, in, in Italy they are using um, the pellet to establish cultures so even uh, to, start, to, to establish primary tumors from circulating tumor cells from the CSF so they use the pellet to initiate uh, primary derived patients, and they've been successfully. Some of them, they 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 arise to to cultures. Okay, thank you. Then yeah, welcome. Can I ask another broader question? Sure, if I can answer. Um, then, like you say, for the prospective evaluation of these liquid biopsies, um, how do you think that we can harmonize the collection protocols and all of the different pre analytical steps be between all of the um, institutions that are working on um, liquid biopsies in pediatric oncology because that can be a very big confounding factor in, in the interpretation of the final results yeah i think that that's a very good question and i think that's the only thing the only way you can achieve this by this particularly this meeting and siop and these initiatives because and here we can have people from different institutions and we can set up protocols uh, in the different meetings to advise people to perform the, in the same way or similar ways. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 I think it's crucial to harmonize and standardize these protocols. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think uh, Maria Gila Costa has a, a follow-up question. If, would you like to activate your microphone again? Yes, you can see my question in the in the answer in the questions. Um, I, <clears throat> what I want to know if if you find some differences in CSCF collected by lumbar puncture or other ways, namely per operatory or DVA, DVI or uh, Omaya and so on. Yes, Do you find some uh, differences. This is as well a very good question, and I think this is something that it needs to be further explored because there are not enough samples and not enough data. It is thought that um, CSF taken from the ventricles will have higher concentration of ctDNA than taken from the lumbar puncture, but um, this needs to be further elucidated. Um, it, it is the, some studies suggest that uh, there's the closer the tumor is to the ventricle, the higher the ctDNA levels are. Um, but as I said, the numbers are still very low uh, to have a conclusion and to determine that. Uh, but yeah, it's something that needs to be further explored. Thanks, Maria. I think the, the time of collecting pre-op or post-op or after treatment, I think it's, uh, we need to control these, these variables, okay? It's, I, I think it's very important. Thank you, yes. I agree. Um, we have, I think, uh, one last question from Reineke uh, Scoot, and then we can move on probably to the next part. Thank you, Teresa. Um, and thank you, Elisa, for this excellent talk. Uh, it was a really basic question, one I barely dare to ask after all these very in-depth questions, but I would like to learn a bit more about the exosomes that you mentioned. Could you tell us a bit more about that? To uh, to the basic MDs, <laughs> how does it work? Like, uh, and and do you have any experience with this? Thanks for raising that. And and to, to be honest with you, I, I don't work in in, and I never work with exosomes. I know people that have worked, and they what they've done is that they look at uh, microRNAs levels, and they've extracted uh, exosomes and extracted the, C, the DNA and RNA. But I'm not very familiar with the method. So perhaps if you want more, I can give you some uh, information later or the person, guide you to the person that uh, it's, it's, it's good to, to, to direct you to. I'm sorry about that. No, 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 thank you very much. Uh, if you have some information that would be wonderful, we're considering it for a study and I really need to learn more about it. <laughs> yes, so, so Mara Vinci again in Italy, uh, she, she's doing, she's working with exosomes and she, she was used to work with us uh, in, in Christians team and uh, she's a wonderful scientist so I'm sure she will be very happy to 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 help you with that thank you you're welcome okay perfect um, I think we don't have any pending questions 
So I'm going to thank uh, Dr. Izquierdo again for, for the brilliant talk.